these notes are the remainder of 4.1 day 3. So I have the dot plot up here, um, and this is data from both classes um, about the proportion of red beads that were in that bag that we drew from today. Um, so I ended up getting 48 dots on the board. And the mean for these 40, so between the two classes, my average proportion, you guess 0.8, it'd be, it'd be pretty close. It's 0.7975, so I just found the average of all these people. Okay, so then that should probably give you a pretty good guess as to what the true proportion of uh, red beads would be in that bag. But I just calculated that a little bit ago. Um, and I'm going to save that. I'm going to save that. Let the suspense build a little bit so you can uh, watch these notes and then I'll come back to that in just a second. So the reason we do that activity is so we can talk about inference for sampling. So the whole reason we sample is to gain information about the population. But we don't have time to do a census of everyone. So we just do a sample, and that's going to give us some information about the population. How reliable it is, I don't know. We'll have to see. So that involves the process of drawing conclusions, making an inference. That means you draw conclusions about a, populi a population on the basis of your sample data. So, for example, um, we were going to try to make an estimate as to the true proportion of the red beads just based on our samples. So that would have been our inference. Like, um, I'm going to do a sample, and whatever I get, I'm going to try to make some inference and see how good that guess is about the true proportion of red beads. Okay, so why should we actually rely on random sampling? Because the whole foundation of statistics is built on being able to actually do things randomly, like closing your eyes and mixing up the bag and then drawing beads out. So first of all, the biggest reason is so you can avoid bias. You can avoid bias in selecting samples from the list of available individuals. Okay? So we want to avoid bias in our results. Randomness takes care of that. The second is we need to trust that the laws of probability will actually give us trustworthy inference about the population. So, I mean, um, probability. Could you have drawn no red beads out of that bag? Yeah. But it wasn't very likely. In fact, nobody did. Nobody drew below um, 0.6 for proportion, by the way. But it could happen. So that's why we trust the laws of probability uh, to take care of us as long as we do things randomly. Um, and then the results from random samples come with a margin of error, a margin of error that sets bounds on the size of the likely error. And I'll show you that in just a second. So like when we talk about um, sample data we can trust, it's like we have this kind of um, a range of values. That's our margin of error. And then the last note here is larger random samples give better info in general about the population than smaller samples do. You can trust larger samples. Okay, so let's focus on this margin of error thing. So what is a margin of error? And, and this doesn't mean like error like a mistake. So margin of error just tells us how far we expect how far we expect the sample proportion in our case for the beads how far do we expect the sample proportion to be from the true proportion at most so let's take a look back at the in class activity and decide what a good margin of error would be so based on what we came up with um, for our 40 points here, uh, it looks like our estimate for the true proportion would be right around 0.8. It's on market here. Our estimate would be right around 0.8. And then our margin of error, where would we feel safe falling in? Let's, I think probably out here to about 0.7 and then up here to about 0.95. So uh, maybe 0.65 to 0.95. Um, that would be like... Um, you could consider it like a margin of error. So if our estimate was 0.8 and we looked from 0.65 to 0.95, so that's 0.15 away. So really, we could look 0.15 in this direction to the right, or you could 
subtract 0.15 in this direction to the left. So this would give us our margin of error here. Things that we would accept um, to occur commonly just based on um, sampling variability, chance variation. And for those of you that, get, that drew actually uh, a proportion of 0.6 or 100%, uh, that's definitely possible. It can definitely happen, but that is actually looks like pretty rare to get those values. All right, so back to the notes here. For the margin of error, that doesn't have to do with accuracy necessarily because I still haven't told you what the true proportion was. You guys might be way off. Maybe it was uh, 0.5. That's not true, but um, so the margin of error doesn't have to do with accuracy. It has to do with precision, like how close that grouping is. So the margin of error doesn't account for bias. It doesn't account for how accurate you are. It only accounts for the variability. So a smaller margin of error would mean it's less variable. A really large margin of error would, would mean it's um, more variable, but it doesn't account for bias. So an example of bias for uh, the in-class activity today um, would be if, for some reason, um, the kids drawing the beads didn't mix up the beads very well, and um, all the red beads just stayed on top of the pile, um, and then our, our, um, our estimates for the proportion were way too high, so that would be biased. But I'm sure it didn't happen. I'm sure everyone mixed it up really well, and it was completely and utterly random. So uh, what's the benefit of increasing the sample size? Well, we always talk about you get better data. Um, you get more trustworthy data. So what does it do? So it is, gives you increased precision. Increased precision. So that has to do with the grouping. So like a tight grouping, that would be good precision. Like you can think back about the dot plot. It's pretty tight grouping. Um, but increased sample size doesn't doesn't increase your accuracy. So again, if people are, if people are um, sampling badly, uh, like not mixing up the bag well and they're getting all reds, um, they would have really good precision, right? Maybe everything's at 0.8, but the accuracy is off. Like you're not really estimating the true proportion because you have bad sampling methods. So increased sample size will give you better precision, but it won't cure um, poor accuracy. Okay, one last time, let's look at that activity again. So, actually, if I took the average of everybody's dots here, got really close to what the true proportion was. Um, I went back and counted after class, and it looked like I had 29 blues in there and 120 reds. So, the true proportion of reds that were actually in that bag. Drum roll, please. 120 out of 149 total, which is 0 0.8054. So our dot plot actually came together nicely. Um, and the average of our dot plot, 0.7975, really close to the true estimate, or the true value, excuse me, it's not an estimate, that's the exact true value of 0.8054. So we must have done a really good job of sampling these beads because since our data is centered here at 0.8, how close we are, our sampling methods were definitely unbiased. If that's the true proportion and we're centered there, we're unbiased. Had this thing been centered down here at 0.4, then it would have definitely been biased. Like we would have been picking all the blue ones, for example. In terms of variability, um, pretty good precision too, depending on how you look at it. Okay, so let's finish these notes off. What can go wrong with sample surveys? Most sample surveys are affected by errors in addition to sampling variability, which is unfortunate. We have to deal with errors. Sampling variability is going to occur. Like that's just why we get dots that are kind of ranging and kind of variable. 
So good sampling techniques, they include the art of reducing errors, and that is an art. You have to be really good at designing these and implementing these samples. Um, the first type of error is under coverage. That happens when people from the population cannot be chosen in a sample under coverage. Like, um, for example, if I said, what's the average height of a Lake Park High School student and you only sampled the West Campus people, that would be under coverage of all the underclassmen. Okay, the next one uh, is non-response. So non-response is also an error. Um, that occurs when an individual chosen for the sample, you can't get a hold of them, you can't contact them, or they just refuse to respond. So if you send out, um, if you choose people for the sample, and for some reason you can't get their responses back, then that would be a form of non-response. Uh, and then lastly here, the other type of um, error that can create bias is the wording of the question. So if you word the question in such a way that um, you try to like uh, persuade the reader or the person taking the survey, that would also bias the results in general. So uh, this last piece here, it says a systematic pattern of incorrect responses in a sample survey leads to response bias. So all three of these in three different colors here, under coverage, non-response, and the wording of questions will give you some response bias. Okay, and then just to differentiate, um, we've already seen the two error, to the two errors in designing the surveys. So these are the ones that are the designer's fault or the designer's flaws that he should have accounted for. First one, um, convenience sample. That's where you just sample the people near you, whoever's convenient. You don't actually conduct it randomly from the population. And voluntary response sample. So if you just um, pose like an open survey, an open question, the only people that respond are volunteers. They volunteer themselves. Well, then the, then the people who are actually in that sample are only going to be the, be the people with um, strong opinions. And then the other three, the ones in the response, so the ones created by the response, those flaws, were these three right here, under coverage, non-response, and the wording of the question. Last little bit here, the AP exam tip. You don't, act to, you don't actually have to name the types of errors that you see. Like if I give you an example of a, of a survey or a sample and I say identify the error, you don't have to name it. That's the point. You just have to be able to describe what went wrong in, like in context of the question. Just describe what went wrong and what that error would do. You don't have to actually name it with these vocab terms. So it's not really a vocab test per se as long as you're able to describe the error and what it would do to the sample. And make sure when you do it, it's in context of the question. All right, that's it for these notes. I'll see you in class.